those four Dhamma summaries that we chatted just now. The first three are pretty general observations. Aging, illness, death, that's basically what it comes down to. These are things that everybody notices. The world is swept away. Things you did when you were younger you can't do anymore as you get older. It offers no shelter. When you experience pain, you have to experience it yourself. You can't share it out with others saying, could you lighten my pain by taking some of it on? Each person has his or her own pain. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. Here in the West we have that in the, the saying, you can't take it with you. All that is pretty ordinary. Things that people notice, and sometimes they take them seriously, and sometimes they notice them and pretend like they, they don't happen. But it's there. What brings these observations under the Four Noble Truths is the fourth Dhamma summary. We're slave to craving. We don't have enough. We live through this life, and there are lots of setbacks, lots of problems, and yet we keep coming back. And depending on how we've handled the setbacks, Sometimes we come back in a better situation, sometimes we come back worse, and yet we keep going for it. And John Munn talked about how he was able to remember a lot of his past lives, and there was one period when for 500 consecutive lives he was a dog, and just really satisfied being a dog. You can imagine having a memory like that. What in the mind would want to go back to be a dog? Well, it's insatiable. It'll take whatever it can get, this mind. So it's up to us to train it, to train that craving. Because who knows where it's going to lead us? The Buddha's image is of a fire. One house is burning, and the wind can carry the fire to another house. And who knows how many houses it can go to? What you want to do is learn how to learn how to starve that fire of its fuel, starve that craving of its fuel, and it starts with a pretty simple set of practices. In the practice of merit, merit's the traditional translation for bunya, traditional in the sense that it's been going on for over a hundred years. A better translation would be goodness. The many passages where bunya is contrasted with bapa or evil, so it's, it's goodness. And this is an area of the Buddhist practice that tends to get overlooked in the West. People go to meditation retreats and they go straight for the experience. They decide, I want to have a good experience on this retreat without realizing that in the context of the teachings, you don't go straight to the meditation. You start with generosity, move up to virtue, develop goodwill. That's, when, that's how you begin meditating, is meditating on goodwill. And all of these things teach you important lessons that you can then bring properly to the meditation. The lesson of generosity or of giving is that giving does have its rewards, but to gain those rewards you have to give first. It also teaches you there are gradations of pleasure. There's the pleasure of keeping something and consuming yourself. There's the pleasure of giving it away and being able to talk to yourself about how good it is to be able to give something away. That ability to talk to yourself 
in a skillful way. That's a good talent to have when you're going to meditate. So you can take a cheerful attitude to the setbacks, realizing that you put in the effort and it may not show itself quite yet, but that was a lesson you learned from generosity. But you can also learn the lesson from generosity that you can learn how to enjoy the act of being generous in and of itself with the knowledge you're doing something good. But it requires that you learn how to talk to yourself and in a convincing way. This ability to talk to yourself that way will also stand you in good stead when there are those setbacks that come as you meditate. As for virtue, that teaches you the, the value of restraint. Things you might like to do, but you learn how to say no. You say no in an effective way. Again, realizing that you may not enjoy saying no, but you know it's going to be for your long-term welfare and happiness. There's a passage where a lay person comes to see Ananda. He says, how is it that the monks can give up sensuality? I think about it and my heart doesn't leap up at the idea at all. And Ananda says, well, let's go talk to the Buddha about this. So I go see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, well, he himself, when he started practicing, when he realized that in order to get the mind into good concentration, he was going to give, have to give up sensuality, thoughts of this sensual pleasure, that sensual pleasure. And his heart didn't leap up. But it was when he talked to himself about the rewards of how you can get the mind still and the usefulness of having a still mind that is willing to make the sacrifice. So that's a good lesson to learn, because you're going to need that as you meditate. Ideas come into the mind, and you see you have an open field here. A whole hour you can sit here and think about anything you wanted to. But what would be the best use of this hour? The best use would be to get the mind to settle down, to gain some discipline. If you have some experience with virtue, okay, it's going to be a lot easier. Again, a lot of this has to do with how you talk to yourself. And there's the development of goodwill. We tend to think of goodwill as an expansive mind state, but the Buddha calls it a form of restraint. Because in your search for happiness, there are going to be certain things that he says you just can't do if you have goodwill for others. Also, there are certain things you can't do if you have goodwill for yourself. That's the whole point of developing goodwill. which is that it prevents you from doing a lot of unskillful things. So all these forms of goodness are restrained on your craving. You learn how to bring your craving in line so it doesn't just go anywhere. Most of us, when we die, are like a glob of mercury. And someone hits it with a hammer, it just goes in every direction. In other words, the little pseudopods of craving will move out who knows where. And they can latch on to anything, whichever one is strongest, it tends to go there. It's like that image of the, the six animals tied to leashes. And then the leashes are all tied to one another. You've got a crocodile, a bird, a dog, a jackal, a snake. monkey, and each of them are going to try to go to their favorite place. The mind has that tendency to want to reach out in all sorts of different directions all at once, but there will be one of the animals that's going to be stronger than the others. In this case, it's probably the crocodile. 
it wants to go down to the river, and it's going to drag everybody else down there too. So you have to look out. Where are the crocodiles in your mind? Where are they heading? The Buddha says you need to give those leashes a post to which you can tie them. Then you can get them under control. This is why we meditate. That, po that post stands for mindfulness immersed in the body. Now it could be focusing on the breath. It could be going through those 32 parts of the body. Realizing you've got this human birth, you've got this human body. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to let it be just a tool for your sensuality? Or are you going to learn, learn to look at what you've really got here? If you took off the skin, what would you have? If you peeled away the flesh, what would you have? Nothing really of any substance, nothing of any essence. Nothing that you'd want to get worked up about. Yet because the mind wants to get worked up, it's because it's a slave to craving. It says, well, even this is good enough. I'll go for it. But look at what it leads you to do. This is usually it's based on our own attraction to our own body, our possessiveness of our own body. And we start looking around for other bodies, other sensual pleasures. So the Buddha says you want to tame your eyes and ears and nose and tongue. You've got to focus on the body. At the very least, have this as your center, with a sense of well-being here. That contemplation of the body is not meant to make you hate the body. It's just to, to remind you, this is a tool you've got, and what's the best use of this tool? You can use that as an object of concentration. You can use that as a tool for getting some order in your cravings, bringing your cravings in line. So you can be a little bit more reliable. So you can get yourself, as the Buddha says, rightly directed. So it's that fourth Dharma summary. That's the one that gives you a handle on the other ones. You realize the problem is not so much them, it's the craving that's willing to put up with them and come back for them. So this is where you've got to focus your efforts. Of course, the should here is not that anything or anybody is imposing on you, but suffering is imposing it on you. So don't look as, at it as an imposition. Look at it as a wake-up call. There's work to be done. And the Buddha is giving you focus for your work. This is where it's best done. And he's pointing this out to you because of his goodwill, his compassion. It's a gift. Remember, he could have chosen not to teach at all. There's that story about how, after his awakening, he stopped to think that this Dharma he'd found was really subtle. I wondered if anybody would understand it, and if teaching would be just a waste of effort. The commentaries don't like this story. He said he didn't really mean those thoughts. He was just being coy because he wanted an invitation to teach, which he got. But I think it points to the fact that as he was fully awakened, he didn't owe anything anymore to anybody else. He was under no compulsion. Which means that the fact that he did teach is even more amazing. It was a totally a free gift. 
to try to regard these teachings as a gift. This is one of the reasons why he instituted the Sangha, so we could have an institution where the Dhamma continued to be taught as a gift, not as an imposition, but as an act of compassion. And think about what that implies about where you are. Okay, you're in a position where you need somebody else's compassion, you need the Buddhist compassion. Because otherwise you're that slave. Think about the king in that passage. He says, what do you mean, slave? I'm not a slave. I'm a king. And the monk who's explaining these Dhamma summaries to him says, suppose someone were to come from the east and say there's a kingdom to the east. Lots of wealth. Lots of things you could take. And it's military. In a military sense, it's very weak. With your army, you could conquer it. Would you go for it? Well, yes. Here's that the king is 80 years old. He's willing to fight for another kingdom. How about if another kingdom to the west? Well, sure. To the north? Yes. To the south? Yes. On the other side of the ocean? Yes. And the monk says, that's what I mean. A slave to craving. It's this sense of not having had enough, not having enough. That's what drives us. And so the Buddhist solution is not simply say, well, just be content where you are. It's to say there's something in the mind you can attain that will have a sense of enough. It truly will be enough, more than enough. And there's a path that leads there. But it will require that you tame your cravings. So look at that teaching as good news, a gift, because there are so many people in the world that don't listen to it, and they suffer because of that. But here's the gift. Make the most of it.